source to estimate what they are. But now you make this operator from the one body terms and the two body terms. You can choose your different types of mappings or supply them yourself. And then we can convert this to polys. We can apply the reduction method that I talk about or any other future reduction methods and get a qubit operator. So what happens here is it spits out exactly the Hamiltonian that you'll put in to represent uh, this H, H2 at a separation of 0.735 uh, Armstrongs, and you get this effective poly operator. Then you can take this, and um, so now there's different ways of doing the algorithms. The VQE is one instance. You just you can have different types of parameters. I at this point I didn't parameterize which optimization we're using, so by default I think it's steepest descent. And you can run this. It takes a while to do it. But now this is just running everything that I showed last year that we did by hand. We did the whole experiment by hand can now be run in a way where people can try and do different types of things and they can get their answer for this problem. Okay. And what I want to try and get to is get it to a point that many type of people, like this doesn't look very modular yet. How do you make it more modular for putting in the algorithms? So, are there any questions? Okay. So, just to show that it's not just us using our device to highlight that many others are. Oops, sorry. You can plot the executions that are running on this device last week. So, this is everyone running on these two devices over the, uh, uh, all over the world. So you see a lot of people in America, quite a lot in Europe, definitely not in the middle of Australia, given that I'm Australian, it's probably somewhere on the coast because there's nothing in the middle. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so you can see that a lot of people are using it. What has been uh, Really exciting t for me to see is now there's over 100 papers by scientists that have published using our device to do other types of science. So they've gone through and come up with things as far as um, like if you just grab some of them out. Uh, so this one is doing compressed quantum computation. There's inequality tests. There's variations. There's looking at adder algorithms. There's a lot of stuff that has actually happened by people doing on the device. So just end with a bit of advertisement for our community and say thanks and answer any questions. You're always, uh, that, that everyone w would love a simple answer to that and then we'd like to just iterate through them, right? And that would make everyone happy. Um, so, so what a quantum computer does is it does, it applies unitary matrices e efficiently. So it takes a, takes a state vector and applies a unitary matrix very efficiently. And if I had to then read everything out in that state vector at the end, then I'm in trouble. So, you because then I would have to read out every one of those exponential uh, uh, um, values. So I can read out properties of that state vector. So if I can come up with the algorithm that applies a lot of those unitaries on some state, and, re and what I only require doing is reading out, say, the mean value or sampling from it, then it's problems of those type. So chemistry and, and physics are examples because generally we're interested in a global property of some system, like is there a phase transition? Why do the molecules want to bond at this distance? Okay, so, and those we can't do classically. So is that also why we need these like quantum algorithms? Because we have to think about the range, like, the mean of a bunch of numbers, if that would ever actually 
you, ne you need to make sure you have a way to compute something. Part of the algorithm needs a part that brings it down to something that is very easy for you to sample from. If it doesn't do that, then you're going to be basically sampling. You, you, you have to sample exponential. <coughs> so um, Fourier transform, the quantum Fourier transform predicts the purity of functions efficiently. So if you can map your problem to finding the purity, so Shaw's algorithm consists of two parts. It consists first of a modular function to map the factoring problem to um, the modular function, and then you look for the period of that modular function. So if there's certain parts of the algorithm, like if you can work out how to map it to something, and then you got a part, the next part of it maps it to something simple. Does that make sense? Well, it always just applies unitaries, right? So you're applying. What do you mean by unitaries? Okay, uh, applying linear uh, matrix multiplication of a unitary matrix. Okay. Okay. So if it's a, if your problem can be represented as a uh, playing linear algebra and taking some vector, hitting it with a matrix, hitting it with another matrix, another matrix, and at the end you can sample, you can project it into a subspace, uh, a vector space of that that's small enough that you can sample from, then you win. But the hardest part of quantum is finding quantum algorithms. But there are a couple that we've found, so there is an existence proof. And if there's an existent proof that says that at this point in day, no classical computation can be predicted to compete with that existence proof. That, to me, I'm more interested in understanding whether or not what it says about our understanding of computation. It may turn out that people find efficient algorithms classically. It could turn out that quantum mechanics is wrong. Or it could turn out that there is things that we can do that we can't do efficiently classically. Yep. First of all, how did you write this code in Python? And uh, which code? The demo you showed us you were running some stuff for quantum machines in Python. And uh, yes. Second of all, there's things that you can't do with you know uh, these programming languages that you can do with quantum computers. You were using the interface. Are you so why did we? Do that? And is your uh, machine even capable of doing that? So we have to turn it to pulses. One of the things that was uh, very challenging was to get the device to be very stable. So you can ask, well, your, what is a quantum language is a good question. There are some good papers out there starting to explore that. I'm not sure we need to fully go down that path while we're in the era without fault tolerant quantum computers because not every operation is going to be available. So I'm more focused in the near term of making tools to learn what we can do with them and how we abstract it away and go higher up the stack over time is a very good question, but I think it's a little bit too early. Uh, why I chose, why we chose Python, a lot of people use Python, a lot of scientists are familiar with it, it's just easier to use. Um, I envision that you'll have many different ones um, we, tr we, we started and even made it outside of Python to try and make sure we define the grammar of a quantum circuit, which we call open quasm, and that's independent of the language. So if we can do something like that, that becomes a reference, and then as we go higher and higher up, there can be other things. Did I answer your question? I think that I think if we can hit three users, there'll always be a need for a user that wants to do pulse level control. They'll want to come down and work out how to do gates better and better. So you want to give them as fine a level of control to make sure that they can do um, what they need to do with the highest fidelity. So we made a spec for that which we call open pulse. 
Um, we put it out as a spec last week and we're working towards making that an API for that. So that will target people that want to go down and really low level, put timing, scheduling, making sure on the timing level. I think you'll need an API that will target as well. Um, people that want to look at circuits and circuit th synthesis and things like this. And then I think you want to also have a higher level API to target the people that want to abstract it. So for the foreseeable future, I want to target three people and be able to come up with ways, three personas of people, and come up with ways that join between them. As we advance, if quantum is successful, which I put a lot of effort in to make it, you should try and you'll go higher up the stack. Like, we don't need to go, you, no one goes in and sees the electronic signals and transistors now. Um, but we're not at the point that we can abstract that away yet. Yeah. So when you were showing earlier the, the spread of the possible quantum states was... Uh, in this, uh, from the experiment? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And then when you like project it and, and try to find it, and it's up, you think you have to project to get your answer. Was that supposed to be like an n-dimensional space of? Yeah, that's a. Star, or? It's a fictitious representation of uh, um, a complex a vector space with no meaning for where the dots are. Okay. It's a cartoon. People have got ideas of looking at principal component, but generally at the moment, they probably require fault tolerant quantum computers, so error free computation. Yeah. Yeah. So for this slide, like, so I'm curious to know what's causing the error, like the temperature or <coughs> the cosmic rays or something. So, so if it was the temperature, and I did, um, if I went here, well, let's go back to the circuit here, and I'll comment out. Um, I'll comment out the bell, and I'll apply um, the Hadamard to the full register without an error. Okay. So now I'm just doing. I'm doing zero zero and making Hadamards over the full register. Okay. If it was the. Uh, actually, let's. Well, I'll show you what this one looks like, but maybe that's not the example I wanted to do. So this one will make an equal superposition of everything, okay? But the one that you probably are meant to say is get rid of the Hadamard and just put put it in a um, put it in the excited state of one of the qubits. Okay, so now I'm bit flipping the first one. on a simulator, so that will do nothing on an experiment now, okay? So now what, I do, what I'm doing is putting the first one in one, and then the temperature then should be, for the second qubit, should be like the population in the other. So when it runs, it'll have four again, and you'll see that that number is much, much lower than the errors that we had before with the bell. So it was probably not the temperature. All right. I think my access just finished with fast access, so we're not going to see it run. <laughs> but what you would see, because 60 jobs are now ahead of me, um, we will be <laughs> waiting quite a while for that to finish. Um, when this finished, it would be um, basically a much smaller um, population on, on the temperature ones. Most likely the error is um, two qubit over and under rotations, not the C not being tuned up. So this is why, um, this is why, with the question before, I really want to get a pulse IPI because that gives people say, I want to just do a C knot. How do I do that better? All right, this will go on for a long time. Yeah. So, how much of the work that needs to go into like rounding error is on the uh, physical side of things versus coming up with more uh, power? Well. So if you could come up with a way of getting rid of the error in the algorithms, that would be cool. I'm not sure that that's too easy. Um, 
to even to not answer your question directly, the task of proving that you have a quantum computer itself is exponentially hard. So if I have to do tomography or measure all my operators and measure them for every possible input, that itself is not an easy problem to do. So I like to say the task of verifying and validating with a proof that is like going to convince everyone that this is a Bayan quantum is a really strong and challenging task. So I think there's even research and even answering that before going to the level you're asking. Any more questions? Yeah, sorry. So a lot of people like to say the number of qubits is the hardest thing. It's really easy to put more qubits down. I agree there's some, uh, um, there will be some limits to that statement on how big. What's way more difficult is making sure that the fidelity of these things uh, stay good. If I don't come up with ways of doing error correction, then every time I repeat an operation, it basically exponentially brings down the fidelity. So you need to either push, get a really higher fidelity to start with, and of course an exponential is gonna beat you, or you need to start encoding the qubits and looking at decurrence free subspaces or full error correcting codes and things like that. So the biggest challenge is actually coming up with ways that we can algorithmically push the errors away. The mitigation idea is just an idea that we put. It doesn't uh, get rid of the errors exponentially, but it polynomially suppresses them in the observables we look at. So there are, are there other tr tricks like that? I'm not sure. calculations uh, on the order of nanoseconds or milliseconds, or how fast are these things? So traditional, like, superconductive computers are really quite slow. So um, the gate speed is, um, the single qubits are 10 to 40 nanoseconds. So this is why an algorithm that doesn't really give you an exponential speed up, just always use a classical computer. If there's no point going to quantum, don't. If it's only got a polynomial speed up, that crossover point is probably going to be long after I've passed away mm -hmm. if you run that algorithm. Um, so the gates in these systems probably won't get faster than that just because there are other con physical constraints. But maybe other systems can go faster. But probably what's going to come more important in determining what you're asking is what is the real gate speed, is how much redundancy do I need when I start doing gates where I'm echoing those errors away or I'm starting to do fault tolerant gates. And that's going to be much, much longer. But if the algorithm truly has an exponential, it's going to have a crossing point. Thank you. A hundred papers <laughs> um, so far. Um, of course, I can, I can predict what a five qubit does. I can predict what a, a 16. Um, with some fancy tensor networks, I can predict what a 55 computer, 55. Um, I think that's what, what 55 may be a bit higher of a depth of about that can do. Um, but what I can't do is predict the errors that are going on and how an algorithm will scale in the presence of those errors and what I really need to do for my codes because there's a fundamental limit. What I think is the most important thing to do with these is to determine what is the real overhead that we need for making them better by doing pushing the fault tolerance and things into them.
and you can do small codes. So, yeah. So, thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to talk to Jay Moore, he'll be outside in the lobby, and you guys can network and interact with him right after. Uh, but until then, let's give a big round of applause to Jay. Thank you so much for coming out here. Was it a rush? Sorry, what? Was it okay? Yeah, it was amazing.